All right, we are live. What is up, y'all? This is Austin Pegram here with the Fitness That Fits You podcast. Uh, just coming to you today with a little reminder to be good to yourself, be kind to yourself, you all. Um, I have with me on the call today, um, on the podcast, a friend and peer. And um, actually, I, I met this individual some years ago when I was still working at Pro Rehab Physical Therapy, kind of starting out. Um, with some of my education and stuff. Uh, Mr. Luke Brom here on the podcast here today. Luke, very nice to have you on the show, sir. Let everybody know who you are and what you do, man. Well, awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, met Austin while I was in my second to last internship during physical therapy school while working at Pro Rehab. Felt like we kind of hit it off right away, having that interest in fitness and kind of overall health and wellness. So, kind of a good connection right off the bat I think you'd probably agree yourself yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah uh, I go, go ahead. ahead no 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 you're fine you go ahead and you finish up yeah so uh I, from Louisville went to St. X High School so I'm sure many of you around here have heard of that um played football there ended up going to University of Louisville and walking on the football team there my whole goal during that time though was going to physical therapy school because I've known from a young age that that's what I wanted to do. It's um, kind of a passion of mine, just, you know, again, going back to that health and wellness yeah. and being able to help people through their injuries and ailments in a non-surgical way. So, like that's always the best way to get through any type of problem you're going through. Heck Plus yeah. letting people deal with pain in a non-medicative way. So that's kind of one of the biggest things that kept me interested in physical therapy along the way. And um, being at U of L, I took advantage of having access to our athletic trainers, and uh, we had a physical therapist on staff. So, whenever someone was hurt, I'd always try to hang around and gain what knowledge I could. And then I ended up going through my own surgery. I tore my right meniscus and missed spring ball my junior or sophomore my sophomore year, going into my junior season. So, kind of led to some setbacks there, but was a great experience for my future career as a physical therapist to kind of have learn that empathy from a patient standpoint. So <laughs> yeah. you know what people are going through and, you know, that's still an experience I draw back onto this day of, you know, putting myself in somebody else's shoes while they're in their rehab. And I feel like that kind of connection helps me build a relationship with people better and connect with my patients. And, you know, people going into a physical therapy environment, it's a, um, uh, a different situation is a lot of time because they've never been there and it's a lot different than your typical medical provider. You're in a big open area. You see a lot of people working out, so it can be intimidating. Right. So being able to connect with people on an individual level and kind of what they're going through really helps them open up and then in turn get more out of their physical therapy experience. So I hate to say it, but I'm glad that I had that injury myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then so my senior year at U of L, uh, it was my true senior year. I could have potentially stayed for a fifth year, but I'd already been accepted into physical therapy school at University of Kentucky. Nice. Uh, so I did, chose to forego my senior or what it would have been my red shirt senior year at U of L to go to physical therapy school because I knew that that was the career for me. I wasn't going to be a professional athlete. You know, I had kind of given up on those dreams a while ago. Uh, knowing that this was a a more safer or a more realistic route, but also a more safe route for my body long term. Yeah, I'd already kind of de developed that interest in health and wellness and preserving, you know, my joints and preventing injuries, which I'm sure you can attest to. Yeah, and in the fitness I've world, all day, every day, I've had plenty. Um, well, well, cool, man. So, so check it out. I actually have two questions. Um, yeah, shoot. You know, to 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 shoot on uh, from the information you just gave us. So, what made you choose football growing up? <laughs> Funny you should ask. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if you recognize yet, but last name Brom. So, in the city of Louisville, I think Brom's pretty much uh, synonymous with University of Louisville football. And now Purdue football, my uh, cousins on my dad's side, Jeff and Brian, all both played, well, and Greg, both, all three of them played football at the University of Louisville. And oh, all wow. three of them actually coach at Purdue University right now. So football is kind of big in my family. And okay. I actually had 
an uncle and some cousins on my mom's side of the family that played football at Louisville too. So it was kind of a, a tradition rich, almost. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Like you, you probably would have been looked at funny if you didn't play football for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, that, well, that's cool, man. And then, uh, um, you know, I didn't expect too much of that, too much of an answer from there. I, I, I was a two sport <laughs> athlete myself in high school. So I always have like a story as to why I chose one over the other. So I just wasn't sure. Um, yeah. But cool. And so the the, the second question I, I wanted to ask you, man. So, you know, you going into to, to PT, I know a lot of times people kind of shift their um, what's the word? I, I guess they kind of shift their focus more to rehabilitation when they go into PT. Like I know a ton of physical therapists that are like, you know, they're not as fit or as active, you know? So like, I guess my question is when you got involved with that, did you still keep that love uh, in, in fitness and that love for just, you know, being strong, lifting weights, et cetera, et cetera? Oh, for sure. I mean, probably two or three days a week, I work out at lunch during work. And then nice. I, prior to coronavirus and everything that hit with that, I actually developed my home gym because uh, fitness is one of my passions. Um, but I also feel like if I'm in a profession that kind of gears around towards fitness and exercise to a degree that I should be able to, within limits, participate in any exercise or intervention that I prescribe to a patient. Right. So I feel like the more I focus on myself, the better I am able to help others. And I actually nice. did a, uh, TED talk recently for part of a leadership and development training program I was in. Okay. Uh, it was just a five minute Ted talk, but I kind of ended the speech with, uh, you've ever been on an airplane, you know, they tell you to put the oxygen mask on yourself. Yeah. So one of my personal philosophies is that before you can inspire oxygen into the life of others, you have to first put the mask on yourself. You are the man. You got to take care <laughs> of yourself before you can take care of others. I love it, man. I love it. Um, you know, you might, you might get in a, you might get in a very interesting debate with, with some of the moms here in the community, but <laughs> I understand what you're saying. <laughs> I understand what you're saying. So, so tell me, you, you also said a lot. I have three questions. You, you also said, and we're deviating here a little bit of y'all, but he, he's already provided a little bit of a, some, some cool <laughs> conversation. So um, you also said, you know, you getting hurt has allowed you to, to experience this, you know, and develop this empathy for some of the patients that, you know, or all of the patients that you may come across, you know, having, being able to put yourself in their shoes. And so in saying that, you know, that's, that's something that I haven't seen a ton of, you know, and I don't mean to, to downplay a lot of the people that I had, a lot of the physical therapists that I have worked with, obviously the work you all do is very uh, essential and, um, you know, and it's in a special in its own way. Uh, but I have, I haven't seen a ton of that from the therapists that I've worked with and like having that empathy, you know, there's always like, Oh, they can do it. You know, they're just not what, you know, the understanding of the kind of pain they're feeling and, and things of that nature. Like, you know, I haven't seen that in people, but when I first met you, I remember, I remember you always had like this way about you, like just kind of like being able to understand them and like uh, just kind of being real easy going with them, like real, like uh, nurturing, if you will. And I thought that was a very, very, very great quality of yours, man. And I'm just curious, like somebody who is very good at that, what I wonder what that's about in, in the physical therapy world, why that empathy just isn't there. Is it just the experience, you know, as a patient, you know, they don't have, they haven't been a patient before, so they don't know. I think sometimes it's easy to one, forget those experiences you've had. And then you go through mm -hmm. all the school and you learn, you know, you're different anatomy, pathophysiology, you learn about the body and how to treat these different ailments. So you know what somebody should do. And right. I think it can kind of boil down to exercise too. Like you, you know that you should go exercise and be healthy and be fit, but not everybody does it. Even though they know that right. they should do it, not everybody does it. And so you kind of got to put yourself in the shoes of someone else to realize what that barrier is to entry for exercise or to physical therapy. So if I can then empathize with the person and help them, you know, connect with me and understand the importance of what they're doing, then they're going to buy in more. And I think that's something that's very easy to get out of because it's just like telling somebody, well, go exercise. It's going to make you healthier. So you should do it. So just 
let me do this manual intervention to help your joint move better and then follow it up with this exercise. And that's why you should do it because essentially I'm telling you to, from my experience, I know that this will help you get better. Um, and I think speaking from my own experience, when I first started, you know, as a novice physical therapist, you don't know a whole lot. There's so much to physical therapy. I mean, I'm almost three years out and I can tell you that I'm infinitely smarter than I was. And I still have an infinite amount of knowledge to gain as a physical therapist. But that connection that I was able to develop with people, I think helped me help them so much more so that empathy has just kind of become a part of my practice because the more you connect with someone, the more they trust you. Right. Okay. I think, okay. I don't know. I might've deviated it, from your question a little bit, but no, that, that answers. I, I mean, and I was, I was ultimately just trying to figure out like, you know, why there aren't more therapists like you, but that, that kind of puts me, and I, and I don't know all the therapists. So I, yeah. you know, I'm just speaking in, in the experience of the, some of the individuals that I've, that I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, but so I, I, say you answered that question perfectly it's just kind of more of a curiosity thing from the outside in well and i think um, too the well, company i work for court physical therapy has a program called the clinical excellence academy and uh okay it's a 12 month program where you meet once a month for like four hours and you meet with some of the top therapists in the clinic or in the company and they educate you on different ways to work different body, body parts and how to help people through different injuries but the first two sessions are essentially all about building trust with the patient and developing empathy and kind of helping them through the physical therapy setting so that you, again, you can develop that connection, that empathy. And so I think it's a lot of the training that I've had. Okay. I've just, I've been fortunate to have some very good mentors in my life, especially through physical therapy. And so I think it's just kind of my personal path that I've been on and that's what I've been exposed to as well. Yeah. So Nice, man. Nice. Um, so, and, and I'm sorry, I, I don't, I may have missed it. I don't know if, you know, if I, if I missed it, they potentially missed it too, but you're, you're, um, you've recently had a, uh, a change in your status at work, right? Yeah. Brag on yourself a little bit, man. What's going on with you? Uh, well, you know, you gotta keep the humble mindset. I don't like to try to broadcast it, but, uh, very humble guy. Very humble guy. <laughs> I was recently promoted to clinic director at the court Shepherdsville location. So I spent the last nice. two and a half, almost three years at the Mount Washington location and uh, opportunity came up and was offered the position. So uh, it's been a good bonus to my life. I could say, you know, yeah. one of the goals that I've had. And personally, I thought it was going to be more of like a five, five year plus goal. And it happened in three. So, you know, it's always good to check off those goals especially when you get it down on a piece of paper, it's a satisfying feeling. Just check it off. I know. Right. Um, that's, that's very cool, man. That's, that's like one of those things, you know, you, you have groups of people in your life and, you know, let's say you have like five people that you're like really close with and you, you obviously see people grow and things like that, but you know, you, you, whether you're close with them or not, like you can like, you know, you, you come across that individual, you spend time with that individual, you see them like in their novice stage and then you just never know where time is going to take you. Two years later, you're about to be the you're or you're the director now of your own clinic, man. That's like it's just really cool to see, you know, have to have met you when you were in your place that you were, and then now that you're, you know, you're you're directing. That's pretty awesome, dude. So congratulations. Well, thank uh, you. I can say I the same to... for you, though. You know, uh, you're working as a tech at Pro Rehab, and I'm there as a student, and now you're out here running your own business. So that's true. Yeah. Give yourself a little props too. <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, I try to do that sometimes. Becca usually has to remind me to do that, honestly. But it's one of those things, man, like you probably know, but like when you're when your head's down and you're just like trying to go and do and, you know, you just like, you know, it, uh, there's not a ton of time where you just step back and you look and you're like, oh, man, like I've, you know, done some pretty cool stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, yeah, there, there's a couple of cool things getting ready to happen here soon that I I'm not going to say too much about just yet, but uh, that'll be for another podcast episode. <laughs> uh, but it, it's, it's funny. It's funny that you mentioned the the empathy thing um, because, <laughs> because now like after working with people in physical therapy and seeing like some of the, like uh, uh, some of the responses you would get from the, the PTs, like you would have clients or patients come in and, 
who were, you know, reported to experience, you know, pain level like 10 out of 10. And, you know, I've had conversations with PTs and they're, and they're like, well, just think about that for a second. Like if this patient was really having a, a pain level of 10 out of 10, they'd be trying to go to the hospital. Like they wouldn't be able to take it at all. You know what I mean? And I was like, ah, you know what? Yeah, you're right. So now whenever I'm like training and stuff, <laughs> I've maybe lost a little bit of that empathy because um, there'll be people that are just like, oh, I'm dying. You're killing me. And I'm like, you're not dying. Excuse my language. Have you shit yourself yet? And they're like, <laughs> and they're like, no, what are you talking about? I'm like, all right, you know, that's one of the first things that happens. You empty your bowels. So don't, don't, don't tell me you're dying. Let's get realistic here. <laughs> Okay. So little stuff like that is pretty funny. <laughs> I think uh, that's a good uh, kind of crossover between one of those boundaries between personal training and physical therapy is in personal training. You know, you kind of have to push people through that wall. Yeah. yeah. You do. I mean, cause that's what you're yeah. trying to do. You're trying to motivate them through, push through um, part of physical therapy. You do have to motivate people, but also too, you have to realize that, you know, some of these people have been in pain for years and years. So, I think that's where that empathy can be, you know, a little bit more important on the physical therapy side of things, just in the sense that, you know, even though that person says their pain's a 10 out of 10, but they're sitting there and they're talking to you, having a normal conversation, right? They're still trying to communicate with you. They're trying to tell you something. This pain is, you know, they're seeing their life through a pain's lens. So like imagine putting on glasses that everything you saw was through a pain lens. And so my yeah. goal is to try to help them take that pain lens off. And so that empathy, that connection that you build can help realize that like, okay, this person, you know, maybe they're not a true 10 out of 10 pain, but they are having pain that influences everything in their life. So, and everybody's pain is individualistic. It's a subjective report. So that's their perception of pain. And you know what they say? Perception is reality. So that's right. I love it, y'all. Hey, (laughs) Luke's the guy. Luke's the guy, y'all. He's got the, he's got all the points here. Um, well, well, cool, man. So I, I'll tell you, I wanted to kind of touch base a little bit also on some of the 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 realm of sports and physical therapy and, and things like that as well. And I and I thought of you specifically um, when I you know was thinking about having this conversation. Um, it's because y- you and like Daryl uh, Williams uh, were were like very similar uh, to me. Like I've always kind of put you two kind of in the same bubble in the way of like the approach you took to to therapy um and i remember specifically we had a kid at pro rehab that you were working with pretty often which by the way um he would come in i think he had a couple more times where he came in after you uh had left and i was working I think with I know him. Yeah, yeah 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 it's a, it a really yeah. a really cool experience like kind of you know having that connection with them but yeah. at any rate you know you were very much trying to get him to be uh a bit more athletic and just kind of moving in a more functional way, considering he is, you know, an athlete playing soccer and things like that. So I really, man, you know, I thought of you when I was, you know, you know, trying to fill, figure out, you know, what role PT can play in the world of sports and athletes and recovery or preventative health, et cetera, et cetera. And just kind of wanted to see what your role is like, you know, in, you know, with court or what in, what roles you play outside of court, you know, in the way of, you know, athlete performance and, and things like that. Yeah, you know, sports was originally one of the big things that got me into physical therapy. And side note, I don't want you to think that I'm as good as Daryl yet. He's got uh, plenty of years of experience on me. So still got some time to be before I'm as smart as or as good as Daryl as a physical therapist. So work in there, you know, got to have goals. Um, but yeah, no, sports was a big reason that I got into physical therapy, you know, being active, growing up in a family that loves sports. I had three older sisters that played sports and yeah, honestly, that one of my sister's injury was how I got exposed to physical therapy to begin with. Uh, yeah, I don't remember how old I was, like seven or eight. And I went into a physical therapy clinic with my sister because she was playing basketball and hurt her elbow. And I went in and I saw that they had a track around the clinic and had all the exercise balls, the physio balls, and they had weights. I was like, oh, this place is awesome. These people don't work. <laughs> and so that, that's <laughs> yeah. what like, originally sparked that interest in physical therapy for me. And so it's kind of evolved from there. And I can attest to the fact that we do work very hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> uh, but, you know, as far as athletics, I think any sports team now, athletic trainers and physical therapists are an integral role in keeping the team functioning and keeping the team healthy 
um, right. even in injury prevention. So working with your strength and conditioning coaches or someone like Austin to modify programs to prevent and Austin, I'm referring to you as well, <laughs> uh, but working with, you know, athletic trainer or working with strength and conditioning coaches and personal trainers to help modify programs for injury prevention. So letting people still push themselves to those boundaries in athletics, but also not go pat, not go too far and cause an injury, not do uh, that repetitive motion too much to cause a back injury or to cause a knee injury that limits your participation in the season beforehand, but also helping somebody throughout the season to one, right. stay on the field if they've got kind of like a nagging knee injury that's bugging them, you know, you can keep them playing sh- or re- rehab after a surgical intervention to get them back for the end of that season, the playoffs or the next season. So I feel like any step you look at in a season, a physical therapist slash athletic trainer is going to be an integral role of the team and athletics. Absolutely, man. And, and, and yeah, and, and, and that's why I asked this because, I think there are a lot of people out there, you know, maybe not so much in, you know, your higher level sports, you know, college and, and, and obviously uh, a professional, but you know, man, like uh, when I, when I was growing up middle school, high school, you know, there, there was just, there was none of that there. Um, you know, and, and I don't think it was just with my school, you know, I feel like it was uh, no. uh, like every, you know, it, it, it had to be everywhere. significantly in the last 10 years. Yes, yes. And, it, yes. and it's, it's always been one of those things that's kind of like really stuck with me. You know, you know, why wasn't that focus there? Would you have, you know, would the community have have bred more, you know, top level athletes if this was here? You know, like, you know, did the individuals that are now very successful in their athletic sport, did they have access to these things? You know, it's something that always like kind of sticks in my head. And then since then, you know, just over the years, like being able to like train athletes and, and things like that. Um, and they're always having this, you know, this, this chronic, this nagging thing that they kind of deal with as athletes. Cause that's yeah. just kind of part of it sometimes, but there's never this idea of, Oh, you know what? To put ourselves in a position to have access to a physical therapist, you know um, you know, th- they're, they're going to help us in the way of, you know, making sure that we can play better longer, you know, um, and I always, I always thought that was so, I always thought that was so odd and I could never like figure it out myself, like why the presence of, of therapy, just like physical therapy, just like, was it there, you know, with some of your, with some of your youth, um, you know, it's just, just very weird to me, man. I think it had to be, and again, I, I don't have any data or research to support this, but I think it had to be just a lack of awareness. Like, right. I mean, even myself, who was interested in physical therapy, I didn't know all the things that physical therapists could offer until I really got working in the field as a tech and then going through physical therapy school and now working as a physical therapist. And I'm sure along the line, someone got a physical therapist, an athletic trainer working with a sports team, had a reduction in injuries, and other people looked at that and was like, hey, this team had less injuries this year. What'd they do different? And then started to see how beneficial it could be to a sports team. And I think once you see that benefit, it just explodes like that. Yeah. Yeah. In one way, I like to, I still, I'll steal this from uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Matt Lee. Uh, he works in the Lexington area, but uh, he calls physical therapists doctors of the movement system. Or, you know, I've also heard people referring to physical therapists as the primary care providers for your musculoskeletal injuries. So I think oh, increasing man. the exposure <laughs> and awareness to physical therapists allows people to yeah. see the benefit that they can provide, not only for athletics, but also for your everyday aches and pains and ailments. Absolutely, man. Oh, yes. Uh, which reminds me. So, you know, let's let's talk a little bit here without without giving too much detail about some of the the um, the the uh, 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 soft tissue slash needlework that, you know, the, the therapist provide and stuff, because that's. That's like a uh, that's a service that I often as a weekend warrior and trainer, yes. if you will. Yeah, that is something that I often will take advantage of. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, like, I think that's a perfect example. But but uh, I, so, I've talked to people about needling for so like for a long time now because I definitely believe in how well it works. But when I say this to people, they're like, oh, is that acupuncture? I, people don't actually know what it is. So people listening will finally be able to find out what I'm talking about. 
<laughs> oh yeah, for sure. So um, dry needling is a great tool that physical therapists have in their tool belt. But just like all tools, you can't use a screw. You can't use a Phillips head screwdriver for a flathead screw. So not all tools work in every situation. But in situations where it's warranted, dry needling is an awesome tool and an awesome thing to take advantage of. Um, dry needling was founded in military physical therapy. They were doing injections into trigger points or knots in your muscle. You can think about myofascial trigger points. And then they were doing placebo injections without medication. Maybe. So that would be called a dry needle. And they found out that they were getting the same benefits with dry needles as they were with the needles with medication. So anytime you can go without using medication, you want to do that. <clears throat> it has since then evolved from using hypodermic needles that you would get medication with to acupuncture needles because they're a lot smaller and a lot less invasive. So it's not acupuncture. We just happen to use the same needles now. Um, it has great effects for, you know, the connective tissue system, especially like the muscular system, um, causing a healing response within the muscles. And I think you can attest to it, just allowing you to feel much better afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, during, during is very rough, but yeah. after you feel way. <laughs> I always explain it as uh, yeah. it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's not the best thing in the world. Yeah, yeah man. It's kind of like, um, I mean, I'm, you've done this absolutely, but you know, it's kind of like if, if I were to get on like a very hard foam roller, you know, and, and it's like, it, it hurts, but at the same time, it feels so good. Hurts so you good. Know? Yeah. It hurts so good. You know, it's a, you know, I, and, and for, for anyone else listening, you know, if, it's it's a little bit deeper I, I mean, Luke I'm gonna have you kind of uh, touch a little bit more on like the specifics of what's going on when you're actually needed, but yeah. it's a little bit deeper than than the foam roller itself you know if I hop on a, a hard foam roller because the, the soft ones don't really do much for me but you know I can find that spot and I can work on some trigger pointing by by moving that limb or or you know and, and also kind of moving my like oscillate move my body over the foam roller and and things like that, like, you know, and, and that will like elicit this, like, whew, this like really like intense response, you know? Yeah. Um, but there's something different about the needling, obviously, because it's, it's penetrating. It provides you with something completely different. And, um, you know, I'm not the best at explaining that, but I think it's something that like would be very beneficial for like clients, you know, weekend warriors, <laughs> if you will, to take advantage of. So what exactly is happening when you're, when you're doing that? So, Dry needling um, is still affecting. So when you do your foam rolling or you get a massage or you've heard of like eye stem or scraping, you're activating mechanical receptors inside the muscle cells and connective tissue to help promote a healing response. When you dry needle, you're actually affecting those at a greater level because you're going inside the muscle. So that's kind of promoting a healing response within the muscle. Also, we're down regulating the nervous system. The way I explain it to a lot of people is if we take a volume knob on our pain or on our nervous system, and so you think someone who's got a lot of stress, they're carrying their shoulders up high, their upper traps are really tight. Mm -hmm. So if we're stressed out, we got all that nervous system activity going on, the dry needling can actually help turn the volume down on that nervous system or calm down the nervous system and allow things to relax a little bit better afterwards. Okay. So those are kind of two of the greatest properties that are going on. And there's some other research out there that can, promotes that it potentially resets or restarts the inflammatory response. Um, a lot of people will go into the inflama inflammation and be like, oh, these foods are high in inflammation. We don't want to eat that. Inflammation's bad. Excessive inflammation is painful and bad. And you don't want to spend time in these pro-inflammatory environments all the time. But Inflammation is a stage of healing. So yeah. whenever you have an injury, you have new blood flow that comes to the area. That's kind of the first stage. And then inflammation comes to the area. And I look at inflammation as little Pac-Man cells that go in and they clean the area. So you imagine Pac-Man going in and cleaning up the mat. That's what inflammation is doing. Okay. All right. But inflammation, if it hits a level that's too high, can't promote into the next stage of healing. So if the levels of inflammation are too high, you can't go on to the next stage of healing which is proliferation. That's kind of rebuilding the area up. So I always say Pac-Man then turns into Bob the Builder and starts, you know, building things up. 
<laughs> but if Pac-Man's got too many, there's too high of a level, then he can't promote to the next stage. And so if we can restart that process, then we can go on the normal healing pathway. Okay. <laughs> you know, we can get into all the chemicals of healing. Uh, yeah. It's kind of confusing. So I feel like Pac-Man and Bob the Builder are kind I of like better look at it. I like the way you did that, man. You you've got it. You've got it up. <laughs> you've got it all broken down. That's essentially like you know. That's a, that's essentially kind of. It's very important, I think, for it, and, and that's why I one hundred percent believe you when you say you have the empathy that you do because you know a lot of times, like I, I can't tell you how many people I've come into contact with, excuse me, physically in person, you know, or online, that are just so hell bent on like trying to educate and sound smart and stuff like that when really the people you're listening like they wow you have the information the people listening they they don't necessarily know what we're talking about or what you're talking about on a more advanced level so like if you can say pac-man bob the builder and break it down like that hey (laughs) people are gonna understand (laughs) i love it i love the way you did that um hey analogies and metaphors are how to communicate to people because yeah get too much in the pt vernacular or medical vernacular you're just gonna lose people Absolutely, man. You've you've been hitting me with the metaphors and the analogy the entire time. That's why I'm like, man, he's got it. He's got it. Like you've got the communication down. Dude. Um, that's great. Well, 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 cool, man. And and the um the needling was kind of a, a side note, just because you know I, I know it is something you know you had mentioned some of these uh these facets of of health that can really help individuals, and so um you know that is something that I have absolutely been taking advantage of over the years um yeah. especially the the more stress you mentioned the traps and the stress shrugging the shoulders always man that's the first place you know i may sure have mentioned that, traps on purpose for you did you yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> um you know I, and i it's actually funny because i i just got done training this morning you know i was feeling fine feeling great and then i had i had a a, a, a personal uh, disagreement happen and um, the the stress kind of boiled in, and I typically don't let things get to me like that. But you, you know, when it comes to uh, to to my kids, you know, I, I I get I get a little. So at any rate, yeah, I got really stressed out, and like it was right before we got on the call, I could feel it. My tra- I started my traps, and yeah, <laughs> I can feel it, man. You're speaking to me, man. You're speaking to me. Um, so if you want to go into the science of how uh, stress affects that, we can talk about it a little bit if you want yeah, to. Yeah, man, a- absolutely. Check it out. Hey, I, when I need people to to get on top of of their recovery and get on top of their fitness and their food and stress is one thing that's affecting their their results, like, I, I you know, that's something that I want to provide as much information on. So absolutely, let's get on top of that. How, why does stress, how does stress affect so, your body like that? Stress has, you know, let's kind of boil it back. Well, I used to use the analogy that we live in the safest time in human history, mm-hmm. but I don't know. I think you could change, you could make an argument that we don't after 2020. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, and for, for more reasons than one, but yeah, yeah I know what you so, mean. So we'll go back to 2019. Overall, the safest time in human history. You know, we don't have to worry about, and I know it sounds facetious, but these used to be real problems that people had, you know, survival. Mm-hmm. So our DNA is essentially has two main goals, survival and reproduction. So every, everything in our body, all of our body mechanisms are kind of geared towards survival and reproduction. So if you think about, you know, you're walking to work and a lion attacks you, you got to run away or you got to fight the lion. So we have two main nervous systems, right? Uh, It's all within the autonomic nervous system. So it's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is the fight or flight response. And the parasympathetic is the rest and digest. Awesome. So we want to spend most of our time, our days, and our rest in our digest system. Um, but if you have a fight or flight response, it's normal. You need to have that throughout your day. So if you think, you know, you're walking to work and a lion attacks you, you either got to fight that lion or you got to run away. You can't just stand there else the lion's going to eat you. And again, I know it right. seems facetious, but it's a good analogy. So no, we're you with you. Today, we're with you. In the time frames that we have in today, that lion isn't going to, you know, attack us on the street. It's just going to be living, like sitting on your shoulder. So Mm -hmm. the stress levels that we had are like the lion sitting on our shoulder. They're not enough to make us go through that full on fight or flight response, but that lion's kind of living in our life. So everything we do, if we have high stress levels or high pain levels, we just got to kind of going back to that pain lens. We view it through that pain, those pain glasses. 
And we got this lion kind of living in our life, affecting everything we do. We know the lion's not going to kill us, but it's definitely there kind of ramping up our nervous system. Mm -hmm. So when you have a fight or flight response, you either need to fight or run away. So your big muscles, your prime movers, they need to move. Things like your quads, your glutes, your upper traps. You know, those are your big muscles that are strong. And your deep stabilizing muscles, you know, those deep core muscles that help stabilize everything, don't have to work as well because you don't need to be in a stable posture standing there. You either need to run away or fight. And so throughout the fight or flight response, we have hormones that are released in our body. One is adrenaline. But when you have the low level stress responses, kind of like what you're just describing, describing, we have a cortisol release and cortisol causes those deep stabilizing muscles, especially some of those ones in our neck to not work as well. So then we get mm. into the activity of our upper traps. Mm. So if we can downregulate that nervous system via, you know, dry needling or even education on stress management, we can help kind of calm down that nervous system and our pain and our involvement of those of that response. Wow, man! All right, dude, you're you're gonna I don't have know, to. Is uh... that- is that a good no, analogy? He- heck, 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 yeah. Heck, heck, yeah. You know what I mean? He- heck, yeah. <laughs> that gave us everything we needed to know. Um, yeah. So, so you all, if you wake up feeling great and, you know, a few hours later, you know, let's say an instance, let's say something occurs, you don't necessarily know that it's going to stress you out. But, you know, 30 minutes after that occurrence, you know, your, your mind is obviously racing. You're thinking about what just happened trying to make a decision how it affected you etc etc and you start to feel like oh man my neck is kind of tight my traps i'm shrugging up everything is getting sore this that and the third it may be a little bit of that process that he was referring to right so you know you're 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 not dying here you know we just need to think about how we take ourselves out of that position and move into a less stressful less stressful habitat how can people combat that though if they're if they're already there you know Mentally, there's work they have to do, but physically doesn't mean their traps are going to stop giving them shit. You know what I mean? Like, what can they do to kind of get out of that that space, if you will? So, because I'm I'm still in that space, so I'm going to need to things. use this. Okay. <laughs> you said you're not dying, and I right. use I use that phrase all the time. <laughs> I tell people I say I say this facetiously, but you're not dying. Mm-hmm. So that puts things in perspective for you. You know, it's a way to kind of, and I sell this from anybody out there that listens to Jocko Willing detachment, emotional detachment. So if you can kind of step back from the situation and take away your emotions and view it objectively, you know, I kind of think of kind of stepping out of your body and you in the situation from a, as a third person, Okay. then you don't have those emotional responses. So you can kind of view things more objectively and okay, yes, this is a bad thing, but it's not going to kill me. It's not going to end my relationship with this person. You can then, kind of control those emotions a little bit better. And maybe that's just my personal way that I try to get through things and not perfect at it, but always trying to self-improve. Yeah. yeah. But also too, and I think you'll like this answer, um, exercise. There you go. <laughs> exercise is one of the best ways to promote an increase in the fight or flight response, but then subsequently a change to that rest and digest mechanic. So Exercise is one of the best things that we can do to help regulate our stress. I'm you know, so glad I had you. All the benefits of exercise on a pill bottle and said, Hey, would you take this? Look, there's no side effects, you know, except for maybe an injury if you do too much, but if you do anything too much, you know, right. so there's no side effects. Yeah. But if you look at all the, pen- the benefits, everybody in the world would take that pill, right? Oh, yeah, I'd take at least four a day. <laughs> everything in moderation you all don't take four of those a day <laughs> stick yeah. to the serving size <laughs> um yeah dude i gotta tell you man i'm so glad i had you on y'all um this is this is this is great information i think people are going to be able to use this information absolutely it's very relative just just your to just your every day um and so if, if you can think about an individual rather, you know, uh, or a therapist, if you will, you know, I I think a lot of times people can uh, cower away from, or, or maybe they're a little bit uh, weary of doctors in general, Um, you know, medical doctor, doctor of movement, doctor of PT, whatever you want to say. Um, and, And I think if there are people like you who have an understanding of just people in general, um, it would make it so much, much easier, you know, because 
I think in this world, and I, I have no business talking about any of this because I don't have enough information, but I think in this world of, you know, insurance and, and, and all of the, the uh, 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 stories, the historical stories of how doctors treat people and this, that, and the third, you know, people just have this bad connotation on it. Um, and I, I think just meeting quality people with quality information who like really care would make such a big difference, you know, um, I, I really, really do. So in saying that, thank you for being you, Luke. You're, oh, well, you're the man. Uh, thanks sir. for being you, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So so I, I want to kind of uh, uh, draw us to a conclusion here. But before that, I have something that I want to ask you that you may or may not be willing to, to answer. So it's a little bit of something on the spot. But um, so – um, as long as I've known and or been around uh, uh, physical, some of the physical therapists here in the, in the city, there's always been like this back and forth kind of love, hate, well, mostly hate relationship with uh, chiropractors. And like, I've always found that to be, I have another question to ask you about the relationship between therapists and trainers, but um, uh, with chiropractors, I've always found that to be very weird, you know, because, you know, essentially what they're, what the chiropractors are doing um, on a less scientific way of explaining it, they're working, you know, with a lot of high velocity thrusts, you know, Mm -hmm. I guess with the expectation, you, you would know a lot better. So correct me if I'm wrong, but with the expectation of creating as much alignment as possible for optimal health. And so, you know, obviously the science is much deeper than that, but um, you know, when, when, when in my head, I think, Oh, that's great. If you do that, plus, plus you enact the, the movement uh, uh, that a physical therapist would, you know, would, would, would help you enable like those two things together. That's gotta be great, but it doesn't seem to me like the two practices like work together. And I, I've always been curious about that. Um, why they don't work together. I don't know if I can speak to that. I think there's, it's a longer story than I know <laughs> the information on, yeah. but I can say that at my previous clinic we did have a good relationship with the chiropractor who would send us patients and um, we would treat them you know the techniques the thrust techniques that the chiropractors use are they're very good at they're that's what they do Um, spinal manipulation in general can be a very beneficial thing for people Um, you know if you look at the research though things don't really get out of alignment like let's take the SI joint for example I'm sure you've heard someone say you've got like a rotated SI the yeah. amount of movement in the SI joint is two to five millimeters. So if you can envision two to five millimeters, let's say there's 2.5 centimeters in an inch mm-hmm. and what there's 10 millimeters in every centimeter. So it's a very, very, very small. small amount of motion. Very minute. And can you see that with your eye? You know, I don't know, but so in that joint, you know, if it's only moving two to five millimeters, is it really that far out of alignment? How much is that affecting you? You know, that's one of those things that's hard to study, but they have studied the research that I've read shows about two to five millimeters movement. Okay. Um, So I don't really like the view joints as getting out of alignment. And I think that's, you know, a position that a lot of physical therapists I know take because of a lot of the research that is out there. Right. But the techniques that they use are awesome. Um, okay. And, you know, physical therapists even use some similar techniques as far as high velocity, low amplitude thrust manipulations. Um, yeah. But a lot of physical therapists also do geared joint mobilizations. So let's say in the neck, instead of, you know, manipulating and popping the whole neck, they go to a specific segment that's sore and or stiff and kind of work on that. Um, okay. There's three proposed mechanisms of manual therapy of like how it works. One is improving the mobility of the joint. Uh, and another one is the patient expectation. And another one is the neurophysiologic effect. So all three of those are kind of responses that happen. And the neurophysiologic effect is again, back to my analogies, the way that I explain it to people when I do any type of mobilization or manipulation is that imagine you got a traffic jam on a highway. And our nervous system is the highway. So we got a traffic jam on the nervous system and we do a mobilization. We get rid of that traffic jam. Traffic is going to flow a lot better. Information through the nervous system is going to flow a lot better after mobilization manipulation. So, um, you know, mobilizations and manipulations can be good, 
but it's all about the science behind it. So, and why you're doing it. So if, you know, somebody's got um, some geared neck pain and we want to do a mobilization of their neck or manipulation, right. that can be beneficial. Outside of that, I don't know if I want to get into a whole lot more detail because I don't want to say the wrong things or I got you. <laughs> you know, aggravate anybody, but yeah, I, I got you. That there's a time and place for everybody and everything. So, you know, chiropractors have definitely, you can't take away the success that they've had with people. I mean, I'm sure you've heard somebody say, I had this problem. I went to chiropractor and I got better. Yeah. I'm sure you've heard somebody say, Hey, I had this problem. I went to physical therapist and got better. So there's yeah. you know, benefits from both. Oh, oh now, man. I'm personally biased. And I think that physical therapy is the way to go, but you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you'd be in trouble. If you, in there first. Yeah. You'd be in trouble if you, if you didn't. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's what I, I always I, say to people. I was like, but I, you would want your physical therapist to say that, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, I actually, you know, and, and, and I'm not at all speaking on, on my feelings of the matter because you know, there, there, there are two realms that I, I don't have, obviously, an abundance of information in. You know, that's why it's a specialization. I have my area. They have theirs. But yeah. I can tell you that um, I can tell you that, like, I have a chiropractor that I go to um, and I think he's I think he's great. You know, he's he's very in tune yeah. with with exercise and moving the body. Um, he respects the the idea that I like to move. And so he gives me education, you know. Uh, um, let's work on, on this. There's a plan to it. You know, let's work yeah. on this. Let me do this. And then I want you to take that extended range of motion that you have and then go and move and, and work exercise, do these things. And I, and I think that that is really cool. I, I feel like if, if, if maybe if ideally there's someone like that who is promoting movement or promoting physical therapy, you know, for movement, yeah. you know, in addition to that, I think it turns into a pretty awesome, you know, combination service. Um, but, but I would imagine that that's part of the problem. Maybe that's maybe that that uh, that that same enabling is not is not there for for some people. And so, yeah, it, that can happen. Now, with that being said, I have a question. So so, you know, there are times where, you know, I can walk around and if I'm paying really close attention to it, you know, if I'm just like walking around being you know goofy or something like that, I don't feel it as much but you know everyone has some imbalances you know and so if i'm walking around i can very very well like notice some imbalances like in my hips for example and like mm -hmm. you know how i need to turn my foot and this all, all this other stuff you know being a hypochondriac but it is yeah. something that i it is something that i i notice and so i wonder now that we're aware of just how little things are being moved out of alignment, um, you know, if that's more of a muscular thing or if, it, if that's more of a muscular thing for most people that they're feeling, yeah. maybe there is some some tightness here and there. Yeah. Or if it is something, you know, a, a spinal, you know, with your bones, your actual anatomy, you know, uh, it, it all just it's very curious. It's I'm, I'm always very curious about it. It's, uh, um, you know, it, it's pretty. uh pretty awesome to kind of just step into the realm of that information but but you um, also got to go back to if we look at the physiologic responses the body responses of just touch in general mm -hmm. there's positive benefits to just human touch so okay you know some things are happen um within you know physical therapy chiropractor just from solely touching somebody just having that human contact has positive benefits as well. So if that makes you more aware of the area, you know, if it makes you feel better and it fixes your problem and you're happy afterwards, does the science behind it always matter? If right. you know, the person gets a benefit, you know, if they, if you are having an issue, let's say you're having three out of 10 pain, it's affecting your everyday work, you're up in trash bottom and you, and you go to a PT or a chiropractor and you get better and you're happy and your pain's gone. Does it really matter? in the end game, you know, that's what we want yeah. is everybody to be happy and be healthy. That's right. Okay. I love it, man. I love it. So um, I at the end, you know, I don't want to talk bad about anybody because I've had good experience. I've never personally been to a chiropractor, but the ones that we've worked with that I've worked with in the past, you know, I think have done good jobs. And so, yeah, that's, that's Dr. Troy Willis, by the way, you all, if you're looking for a good chiropractor, um, he's a, he's a good guy to go to. I'm not going to, 
market too much for him. He, I can have him on the show and then he can do it himself. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, well, cool, man. I appreciate the enlightenment there. I, I was going to ask you about the relationship between, you know, trainers and therapists. Daryl kind of touched on that last time also. But as a trainer myself, I can tell you that, you know, I very much appreciate the work that therapists, that physical therapists do, because, you know, if I have an individual that I'm working with and there is something, you know, limiting them, from being able to do X, Y, Z, I need them to, you know, we can, we can work on that as much as possible with the knowledge that I have. But if after two, three weeks, you know, it doesn't seem to be improving, I need them to go get that, you know, you know, professionally, you know, looked at someone who has the, the necessary information in that field to, to assist and help them so that they can come back and, you know, continue their, their strength program with, with myself. Um, but I think there's like this competition um, in the in just like the fitness industry and the physical therapy, physical therapy industry. And like, you know, that's and that's why I follow a lot of, you know, that's why I like people like you. I follow people online like Dr. John Russell, like who, he's a physical therapist and a movement specialist, you know, a coach, a trainer. Mm-hmm. Like I follow people like that when I'm trying to learn, when I'm trying to get certifications, because those individuals like have you know, uh, both sides, you know, both realms. And so, you know, it, 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 there's, it just provides a bit more of a, um, I guess a, a collective understanding on it all, if you will. But I've always wondered, I've always wondered if you've had kind of some of the same issues or, or some of the same like, uh, complications with like trainers versus therapists and things like that. That's like another big debate. I feel like yeah. there is, you know, so in my mind, I just see it as, two totally different realms. Um, you know, you have your place and I have my place and we're both working to help people. Yeah. Um, so I think sometimes physical therapists, you know, if you look at it, if you're an outsider and you just watch somebody go into physical therapy clinic and you saw physical therapists evaluating them, doing a little manual therapy and then give them some exercise and you're like, well, why can't the personal trainer give me some exercise? So if you just see it from the outsider perspective, but if you're actually inside, and I think you can attest to this too, once you get inside of a physical therapy evaluation, there's so much more going on. I'm not just giving them exercise to give them exercise. Like I'm doing a full evaluation of their movement system. And I'm looking at, you know, let's say they're having shoulder pain. It could potentially become from their neck. And so I've got to assess mobility in their neck, activation, of different muscles. Then I got to actually assess the shoulder itself and then assess the whole nervous system you know, from the neck down the arm, because all the nerves from the arm (laughs) originate in the neck. And then I'm going to find specific deficits that they have. Like, let's say when they're going up overhead, they have some winging of their scapula. And I know that if they're going in shoulder flexion, the scapula is winging. I know that the serratus anterior might not be kicking on and working as well. So I'm going to have them do a specific geared exercise to activate the serratus anterior. I'm not going to put them through a full exercise routine to strengthen shoulder flexion because that's not what they need. They need serratus anterior activation. And then I'm going to get them through their problem. And if they, you know, I've had people ask me before, well, how come you don't ever personal train people on such? Well, that's not necessarily my realm. That's not what I do. And so once I get you through your ailment, your impairment, then I would refer you to someone like Austin. And be like, hey, I got this buddy over here that does great. And if you want some personal training, he's going to kind of get you in that full full body fitness. He's going to have more of the science behind like building up strength and things like that. Whereas my goal is to not necessarily not build up strength, but to address your specific impairments. So yeah. I think it's a lot more individualized and focused on that particular person, on that particular joint. than training in general is kind of that overall body awareness body health building up strength kind of globally right yeah no absolutely and because you know and i and i kind of break it down you know in the same way you know i I break it down short term versus versus long term you know your physical therapy needs to be short term like you get in there you have a plan you fix a problem whether it be six months a year however long insurance pays for and then and then you have your long term you have to be able to keep that up so you know the longevity is going to come with you know your strength training that you do with the coach or if you're autonomous enough to to do that you know on your own right that's something that needs to be kept up i wish i wish that relationship was universal i wish there was you know a, a connection between 
the two to where you had a therapist who would work with someone and then have a, a database, you know, of people that they trusted and refer that individual to a, a personal trainer and then be able to to uh, 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 add that plan, if you will, or discuss that plan for the client uh, slash patient. Uh, well, discuss the plan for the patient now moving it to being a client. And mm-hmm. then that way we, we kind of follow that plan in as closely in accordance as, as, as need be. I think that would be an awesome world to live in, you know, yeah. but um, you know, it's, we're not, we're not there yet, but we will get there. We'll get there. <laughs> All yeah. That would be awesome. <laughs> we'll get there. So uh, one of my but, yeah. biggest things is I always want to try to make people independent. Like I don't want to make people dependent on me from like a physical th- therapy realm. You know, oh, yeah. if they want that, uh, coach me through this exercise, help me through this strength. And I'm like, I'll help you through it for your specific impairment of your shoulder. But that's not necessarily my job is to help your whole body fitness. Um, and that's where someone like you comes in. Right, right, right. Good. Um, love it, man. All right. So, so I kind of wanted to, um, I wanted to go ahead and close out here. Um, you provided us with some wonderful information. Um, and I'm so glad I had you on the show. Um, so just kind of wanted to see, man, like, you know, what sort of ending statement you had for, you know, for people, you know, to, to stay healthy, to continue moving, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Touch one more time on, you know, where mm-hmm. people can find you, because if you're looking for a therapist, you all, I'm, I'm telling you, Luke's the guy, obviously you're hearing him. So, you know, what's up. So, you know, I want people to know where they can get in touch with you and, or, um, the, the, the company that you company and location that you work with. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, see your, see what you got. Yeah. So, uh, again, Luke Brom, I'm at uh, Court Shepherdsville, which is right off 65 and Highway 44. Um, you can find us at, online at KORT.com. And then my email address is lbrom at court.com. That's L-B-R-O-H-M as in Michael at court.com. So feel free to shoot me an email if you got any questions about physical therapy and how it can help. And you know, Shepherdsville is not the right area for you. I've got plenty of referrals all over the city that I feel comfortable sending people to. So feel free to reach out whenever you have a question. Um, and I think that, you know, I kind of my statement earlier is, you know, before you can inspire oxygen into the life of others, you have to first put the mask on yourself. So I always think it, it's important to take care of yourself, your health, your wellness, especially in kind of the crazy times of the world. Yeah. And so putting putting yourself first isn't necessarily a bad thing because you can take care of yourself to then in turn provide more and more beneficial help to others. Right. I love it. I love it. So, and, and, and just to, just a reminder, y'all just to touch on it again, I, I, I wanted to have Luke on the show for the sake of obviously uh, talking to, and, you know, you all meeting great people, but um, you know, he just, as you can see, has a ton of information and he makes that information relatable. And my goal of this podcast is to provide information um, in a relatable fashion. So uh, I would say we accomplished that here today. I only hope, I hope that I don't get any any flag here from some of the boys and, and women over at uh, 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 Pro Rehab. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll see. They're like, how you going to go to the... <laughs> How are you gonna go to the <laughs> to the right? I can already hear Daryl yelling at you right now. Yeah, he's gonna have something to say, something to say. Cause I he, so he pro rehab, it's right down the street from from where I train. So like I, you know, there oftentimes I'm just like, Daryl, I gotta get in real fast to, to come and see, you know, for a quick session or something. I'll come in there and I know one of these days he's gonna really give it to me with the needling because I had you on the show. <laughs> but you know what, man? You know what, man? I'm glad I did it. Cause you, you gave us some, you gave us a lot of value today. Um, hey, what it boils down to is helping people get better. So however that's right. they get better, I'm happy. That's right. I love it. I love it. All right, Joel. Well, uh, in saying that we are closing out here again, this is the fitness that fits you podcast. Always a reminder, be good to yourself, please. Don't forget about our, um, uh, women's wellness retreat coming up on, uh, the 24th of April through the 25th. Uh, of April uh, going to be a lot of great stuff going on. We've got a wonderful female trainer and uh, life coach tagged in on that as well. And we are going to have a very special 
catering service there as well. Uh, 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 a meal plan service that you may already be using. I'm not going to disclose that. I want you all to find it out. We'll find out later here in the upcoming days. Okay. Um, if you have any interest in coaching, and I hope that you do, because I am here uh, and passionate about getting you stronger and working through health and wellness for longevity. Uh, my coaching application will be in the link or excuse me, in the description, serious applicants only. I want you to want to make a change in your life. If you believe now is the time for you to make a change. Okay. So that'll all be listed here. Contact information will be as well. IG is Austin FTFY and Facebook is Austin Z Pegram. You can go and become a part of our group page, the FTFY information community, always live, always putting up information there as well. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of your evening. If you're listening to this at night before you go to bed, have a great rest of your day. If you're listening to this in the morning, see you.